In this part of the tutorial, we will examine the topic of graph data structures mostly with respect to solving Sudoku. Unlike the rest of this tutorial, which is presented in a code-along format, this lesson will be different. Instead of rewriting all the code, we will look at the basics of a graph data structure, how I modeled a Sudoku puzzle as a graph data structure, how I created, tested, and improved my algorithms to the point where they could generate 100 puzzles in roughly 400 milliseconds. Before I proceed, I suggest you read my article on Free Code Camp, which explains the fundamentals of software engineering in a clear and accessible way. That article explains these topics assuming only that you have some basic coding skills. Let's start by asking a question. What are graph data structures? The simplest verbal explanation I can think of is that they are a family of data structures which are useful for modeling a bunch of things which are connected in some way. To connect that definition with something visual, you can imagine that the bunch of things are a series of nodes or points, and the connections between them are a series of edges, which you can think of as lines connecting the points. So whenever I say the phrase graph data structure, a better term for most people to understand this topic is a network data structure. In fact, that is exactly how they are used in apps like Facebook to represent users and friends, Google Maps to represent city addresses and the roads connecting them, or Sudoku puzzles to represent tiles which have relationships to each other according to the game's rules. Pictures and words are fine, but the code is more important. How do we tell a computer system to virtually represent a Sudoku puzzle? This process is more concrete than you might think, though it helps to be an expert in the programming language you are using. In principle, the process is to take all of the information you know about the problem you are solving, i.e. the problem domain, and start writing code which describes it. First, we represent a single tile in a Sudoku puzzle with the class Sudoku node. It has a value, x and y coordinates, and a boolean to establish whether it can be edited or not by the user. Read-only true would indicate a node which is a given clue at the start of a new Sudoku game. Now, this term color really just means a value from zero to the boundary of the puzzle. So a 9x9 puzzle would have the colors zero to nine. To be honest, I don't like using the term color as it confused my hyperliteral brain, but please understand that it really is just a number value and the term color is actually irrelevant in this problem domain. Where the word came from is that this kind of data structure was used to solve a problem that involved coloring different countries on a map using a fixed set of colors. We could have just as easily associated these numbers with different kinds of sandwiches, but to the computer it is the same thing. In any case, if you hear me say color, just remember it's a value, it's a number, not literally a color. Now, the data structure itself must include every element, as well as the connections or relationships between every element. There is no single way to do this, but I arrived at using a linked hash map data type from the Kotlin Standard Library. This data type preserves the ordering of its elements and allows me to find a specific element based on a hash code. The hash code itself comes from this simple hashing function which generates a unique key based on the x and y values of a node. The linked lists themselves represent both the root node at a given x and y location, as well as any other node which happens to be in the same row, column, or subgrid of that root node. The root node will always be the first node in the list, known as the head element, but other than that we don't care about the ordering of the rest of the list. So after I figured out how to model a Sudoku game in this way, the next step was to start writing the algorithms to manipulate my chosen data structure. The first algorithm I wrote was called build nodes. Its job was to build the skeleton of our data structure by adding an element for every tile in the puzzle. A square size n Sudoku will have n squared tiles or elements, so the first thing I did was write a unit test to check for that condition. Here we see the first example of the process I used to write these algorithms. I tried to solve the problem one step at a time and to verify the correctness of each step as I went. Next, I knew that I needed to create the edges or relationships between different tiles based on the rules of the game. Nodes which share a column may not have the same value or color. Nodes which share a row may not have the same value. Nodes which share the same subgrid may not have the same value. 
Now we haven't actually added any values yet, but we can still build the edges of the graph using these rules. After looking at a picture of a 4x4, 9x9, and 16x16 Sudoku puzzle, I was able to determine that every tile will have the same number of edges as any other tile, and those numbers happen to be 8, 21, and 40 respectively. At first the test was failing, but I figured out that a node can be, for example, in the same column and subgrid, so I needed my algorithm to be smarter about avoiding those kinds of repeats. The previous two algorithms were child's play, whereas now we get into some more difficult problems. The seed colors algorithm caused me huge problems and took many days to get working properly. The purpose of this algorithm was to provide some initial values, i.e. seed values, to make the next step in the algorithm easier. At first I tried to do this by distributing the values diagonally, which is a relatively safe way to avoid breaking the rules, but this approach led me to an uneven distribution of initial values. I thought this was a problem and eventually came up with a new algorithm that would make horizontal and vertical passes of the entire puzzle, allocating numbers in such a way that was guaranteed not to break the rules and provide an even distribution. While I'm proud of this algorithm in a certain way, on a certain level it's also disgustingly complicated and proved pretty difficult to test. I settled on ensuring that it wasn't creating an invalid puzzle and it was allocating a number of values roughly equal to a quarter of the total number of tiles. If I allocated too many tiles, it would cause problems though, so I had to include some hard-coded edge cases which I didn't really like. Perhaps the most important algorithm in this series of algorithms is the solver algorithm. The solver algorithm takes in our seeded graph and attempts to solve the puzzle from there. Now, I had already written a few other solver algorithms that didn't use graph data structures, so I was curious to see if using a graph would actually make this process easier. In some ways it did, but it was still overall quite difficult to write a high-performance solver for n-sized Sudoku puzzles. Every algorithm for generating a Sudoku puzzle that I'm aware of makes usage of three things. Brute force random number assignment. Checking if these new assignments create an invalid puzzle. Backtracking when an invalid puzzle is created or the algorithm is simply not able to allocate any new values without actually breaking the rules of the game. The problem with brute force random number assignment is that it scales very poorly as the size of the puzzle grows. Randomly generating a 4x4 Sudoku puzzle is quite easy that way, but even a 9x9 puzzle can take a long time if you just use random numbers and backtracking. There's no way the app would be any good if the user had to sit and wait for 5 minutes just for the app to generate a new puzzle. As is often the case, the solution to this problem came from figuring out the right question to ask. How do I tell the computer to make smart decisions about assigning values instead of just purely random decisions? In the end, I settled on giving the algorithm a nice value, which is inspired by nice values in CPU scheduling. In principle, the algorithm will select an empty tile and look at the number of possible values we can assign to that tile with respect to the rules of the game. This is done by looking at the rest of the elements in the linked list for that tile and seeing how many of them are already colored, that is, given a value. In a 9x9 puzzle, if 8 other tiles in the list already have a unique value, then the tile we have currently selected can only have one possible correct value. If 7 tiles are already colored, we have a 50% chance of guessing the correct number, which is still pretty good odds. So the nice value represents how picky the algorithm is in deciding whether or not to assign a value. The nice value itself is adjusted constantly with the basic idea being two things. If the algorithm has looked at many elements and could not find a sufficiently safe guess, we increment the nice value, thus allowing the algorithm to make riskier guesses. If the algorithm assigns a value, it becomes pickier again by decrementing the nice value. The other important part of this algorithm is the multi-stage backtracking. This part was very difficult to figure out, and it required trying a lot of different approaches in order to work smoothly for 4, 9, and 16 boundary puzzles. I settled on using three stages of backtracking. In the first stage, when the algorithm gets stuck, we remove half of the values we have allocated to the puzzle. In the second stage, we remove all values we have allocated to the puzzle, but we keep the same seeded values. 
In the final stage, we remove all values and generate a new seed, then reset the algorithm to start from scratch. After playing around with both the nice values and the conditions for each stage of backtracking, something magical happened. I made one small change to the nice value adjustment and suddenly, as you can see from my benchmark tests, the algorithm was generating 101 9x9 Sudoku puzzles in roughly 400 milliseconds instead of over 4 minutes. At first I didn't trust what I was seeing, but after removing the change I had just made, we were right back to minutes instead of milliseconds. The key takeaway is that every time I made a small change to the algorithm, I reran the benchmarks to see what changed. Tests are absolutely critical when you are writing new algorithms, as they tell you both the correctness and efficiency of your code. I was super excited to have a working Sudoku solver that was crushing my benchmarks, but there was still one more algorithmic dragon to slay. As you can guess, a solved Sudoku puzzle is not actually useful to a person looking to solve a Sudoku game, which happens to be our entire user base. Having generated a complete and valid puzzle, the next thing to do was to remove a certain amount of values to make the game playable again. At first, I thought the difficulty of a Sudoku puzzle was largely dependent on how many initial clues are given to the user. That idea is true at the extremes of a complete puzzle or an empty puzzle, but not so true in the middle. What I mean is that you can definitely have a Sudoku puzzle with 33 given clues that is easy to solve without guessing, and have a puzzle with 38 given clues that is impossible to solve without guessing. So I suddenly realized that I was going to need to invent some way of establishing the difficulty of a Sudoku puzzle in a consistent way. Now, I knew that there must be some way to do this mathematically, but the truth is that mathematics is not a natural way for me to solve problems. I was great at calculus, but only for the reason that I could visualize the graphs which the equations described. Instead of trying to model this problem in mathematical terms, I visualize the things that I actually do in order to solve various difficulties of Sudoku puzzles. I then figured out how to tell the computer to employ these different strategies to attempt to solve a puzzle without making any random guesses. This led to creating three kinds of strategies which dictate the difficulty of a given puzzle. In the basic solving strategy, a puzzle can be solved simply by going through each square and asking if there is only one possible value that can be placed in that square based on the rules of the game. In the advanced strategy, we still use the basic strategy, but we also look for a situation where a node has two possible values. We then look for another empty node, which has an edge to the original node, that also has the same possible two values. Finally, we test assigning both values to both nodes. Three things can occur when this happens. If both result in a valid Sudoku puzzle, this doesn't actually help much because it's possible to make valid assignments that still result in an invalid puzzle later on. If both result in an invalid puzzle, this is obviously not a good situation. Finally, if one configuration is valid, but the other isn't, then logically the valid configuration is correct. The final solving strategy basically means that the puzzle cannot be solved in a purely logical way, i.e. you must make guesses to solve it, or it requires some kind of advanced strategy which I'm not aware of. I'm not an expert in Sudokus, but I'm better than the average player, so either way I would consider that to be a hard puzzle. 